let's start into chapter 9 now. So we're basically, we're done with sellers, frankly. Chapter 4, find a seller. 5, make a presentation. 6, get him to sign a contract. 7, service the listing, right? 8, how, where are you going to advertise it and how are you going to advertise yourself? Let's leave that for a second and at the end of today, let's move into some buyer stuff, right? I have a few chapters talking about, uh, really three chapters dedicated to the buyer. Now, are we going to make money having listings or having a bunch of buyers? Listings, listings right? So I don't want to skew the big picture. You can have seven or eight listings and not go crazy. You can't have seven or eight buyers at one time and not crack a little. Because a lot of those buyers are going to want, they're tugging at you, right, from all directions. So you got to show a property, you have to do all sorts of stuff. So let's talk about here on page number 306, the appointment. Most of us as new real estate agents, our early deals are not going to be listings. Most of us, our early deals are going to be what? Buyers, right? They're going to be buyer leads. How many of you know somebody who wants to sell right now? Sell. Somebody wants to sell. Three. How many know somebody who might want to buy? So like nine, right? So there's more people, it's just buyers are just easier to get, frankly, than listings are. Back, I'd say something like, oh man, I don't know, like uh, as recently as 2004, five, six even, seven, it kind of started to change, frankly. But 2003, four, and five, a lot of brokers, when you met with them, would say the following to, hey, Heather, you know, come work at my company, and the reason I want you to work here, why it's going to be good for you is that we have a lot of floor time here. Floor time is opportunity time. We're like, you know, one real estate agent will be assigned to take all the inbound calls for some four or five hour block. You know, it's like when you go to buy a used car or a car, you walk onto the lot and somebody shows up and says, can I help you? That's a up call, right? It's the same. It's like floor time. It's the same thing in our real estate business. Now, it's all changed, right? The for sale signs don't necessarily have the company number on them. Whose number's on the for sale sign? The listing agent's cell phone number's on the for sale sign, right? A lot of institutional advertising doesn't happen anymore, right? Real estate companies, you look at the LA Times 10 years ago, the real estate section, every company had a big, huge, full page spread in print, got the phone to ring. Change though, but even still, if you're running ads on Craigslist for your own listings, you're gonna get phone calls. What happens if the guy calling you calls you from a block number, you pick up, you want, do you want the phone number? Yes. You want the phone number so you can follow up. What if he says, I don't want to give you my number? I'm not rich enough to be able to hang up the phone on a guy. You know? <laughs> I'm on a landline, don't worry. Oh, you're in a, okay, I'll call you in 10 minutes then, no problem. <laughs> email address, okay, great. You know, I have an old AOL address I gave all my spam stuff to. You know, coolguy63 at AOL.com. Just email me there. Cool with the K, by the way. I'll just call you, what, a half hour? Well, block number, I don't have time. You don't have <laughs> right. You may not have to, remember, we're, we're not the ones, you're looking at this maybe from a consumer or a personal perspective. As a real estate agent, if, somebody, if my phone rings and it's a blocked number, unfortunately, what do I have to do? I got to answer it. Somebody calls me for a number I don't know. Honestly, what am I going to do? I got to answer it. If you're a real estate agent, you got to pick up the phone, right? I mean, or you're going to, I mean, it's money, right? So a couple things here to think about. How about, what, really quickly, do you have to put the address in every ad? No. Do you think real estate agents leave the address out sometimes just to get the phone to ring? Of course. Do we have to put the price in every ad? No. Leave the price out. Why? Want to get the phone to ring, right? So a couple things to think about. And the book talks about this here. If you look at page numbers 308 through like 312, when the caller won't give a name, when the caller won't give you their phone number, when the guy says, I just want the address so I can drive by. So. Let's look at a couple of these here. Let's look at one objection of, I just want the address, bottom of 311. Right now, as a brand new agent, we don't have any listings. So what are we probably advertising? Company, else's. company listings, right? Co with company listings that we have at the company. So question for you. It's not your listing. 
if you give me the address and I'm the buyer, you just sold that house for the listing agent, right? Because I'm going to drive by it, like it, look at the for sale sign. I might even have liked you. I want to talk to you. But I'm just going to call the number on the sign, and then they're going to take me down in a second. So how do you deal with that? I just want the address so I can drive by. How about if I need to there? Excellent. Level shift, right? So how about this? No problem. What time were you planning on driving by? Now, I don't really care what time you're planning on driving by. It's just a way to neutralize the question. You've heard politicians do this all the time, right? Like, uh, why did you vote to dump nuclear waste on that kindergarten? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, but the real question is, and they talk about something else, yeah. right? So same thing here. Well, what time were you planning on driving by? I don't know, about 4.30. Great. Well, if you're going to invest your valuable time driving by the outside of this property, please let me make arrangements with the owner so you can see the inside at the same time you see the outside because you can't judge a book by its cover, not with this property. Now, this property is at the top of a hill. Your GPS might cut out. What's your cell phone number? In case you get lost, I'll call you, and here's mine. What if they don't want to give you the number? Sorry. Please. I say no. You say no what? <laughs> Surpri that's, that's surprising. I wouldn't know. You wouldn't have expected, because there are some funny people out there, and I've been dealing with funny people, so. Who's funny? So you don't want to meet the client? No, 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 no. Wait a minute. If somebody doesn't want to give me their phone number, uh -huh. then I don't feel secure. Right? Right. OK. Why don't they give me the phone number? Because as, as bugged as you are at them, they're triple bugged by you. Not you personally. They're but calling me, right? Right. They are calling you. So they're calling me. Well, right. I, 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 if they don't take it, I, that's a personal issue. No I problem. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But they're the customer. Right. Yeah. What about if he tells you 9 o'clock at night? Oh, well, then you're not going to meet them at 9 o'clock at night, no, 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 right? No, I want to talk by. What would you do? No, well, here, no problem. Give Go. me the address. Give me the address of the property. And tell me, would you put your client that house is, is empty? Well, right. Some of this requires some level of common sense, right? I mean, if, if the client says, meet me in Barstow at midnight, you're obviously going to say, hey, you know, I don't know that this is the best course of action. But the point is, is that you're going to get a lot of salespeople, or you're going to get a lot of clients, frankly, that just don't want the real estate agent calling them 50 times. Just as much as you might not want to deal with them, trust me, they're six times they're, you know, five times as much. They don't want to deal with the real estate agent, right? They want to just get the address, look at the property. I'll call you back later. So the point to this simply is we need to make sure that we get from the point of the client calls in. I'm not rich enough to be able to hang up the phone. I don't have enough money to be able to pick and choose my clients, right? I'm going to, I think I share your position. I'm not saying this is a wrong position. I'm just saying that I'm just not at that point in my career. And I hope I'm never at that point, frankly, where I turn someone away. I always want to make sure that I can do my best to help whoever because the initial conversation is always going to be a little awkward, right? The, you're not sure if the client's for real. They're not sure if you're a good agent. I mean, there's always going to be that dance of you have to prove yourself both ways. So if they don't want to give you the address here on page 311 and 300, or if, you, if they just ask you for the address, either give it to them. You have that option. You have the option of if they don't want to talk to you anymore, you have the option of ending the conversation fine. Or you have the option of being a salesperson and close for the appointment. So the question is, I don't want to give you my phone number. You're at the point where I don't want to give you the number, or the client doesn't want to give you the number. One option is, don't deal with them. Fine. What's another option? Well, let me ask you first. Please. Yeah, yeah, if you ask. <laughs> yes, you can use a caller ID unblocker, right, I suppose, and, and bounce the. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, so you are, they don't want to give you the number. You are sincere about buying a home, aren't you? Of course. Well, homes come on the market every day. And it's going to be frustrating for me and disappointing to you if one comes on the market that meets your needs and I can't get in touch with you to tell you about it. I won't abuse the privilege of having your number. I'm only going to call you when it's in your best interest. What's your number? Now, that may not work either. 
But you have to put yourself in a position where at least you're trying, right? If a client wants to hang up, fine. But these are things that you'll deal with as you get buyers that call in on your stuff. Now, the young lady's point about your safety on 313, extremely important. Because we are out there dealing with the general public. There is no filter between the public and us. There is no buffer. So what are some common sense things that we're going to want to look at on page number 313 with regard to our safety? What are a few things? Maybe meet them at your office first. That's fine. What else? Don't go at night. Exactly. Don't go at night. Guy wants to meet you at 9 o'clock at night on a Tuesday. You're not going to want to go. And I wouldn't recommend going either. What else? Tell someone where you're at. You're in a cheap tell, them where you, tell, tell someone where you're going. Dress appropriate for the occasion. Right. This is all extremely important stuff. Maybe have a partner that you can call or text when there's a problem. Hey, look. Ring, ring, hello, maybe my client's over there, I feel weird. I might call my buddy, maybe my buddy's John, and say, hey, John, I'm at 1528 Main Street with Mr. Jones. Can you grab the red file on this property? Now, in case the client's not trying to kill me, I haven't insulted him, but at least I've told someone where I am, who I'm with, and that there could be a potential problem. So these are all things that are important to at least be vigilant of as you're going through your real estate career, showing property to strangers in areas that are maybe a little unfamiliar. Yes, ma'am. Right. If they've been, been pre-approved by a lender, they've given their social security number, we've run their credit, you have a bank statement, you have a, or if they're paying cash, you have a bank statement, yeah, bend over backwards, right? I think the conversation's just like that initial contact. Guy's like, hey, can I? Yeah, you want to, you wanna, of course, be a little careful. You'd be surprised, though. Some agents are so hungry to put a deal together, they'll go anywhere for anyone at any time. <laughs> hey, this is, oh, no, no. No. It's, it's, should have seen the other guy. So here on page number 314, really quickly, 314, we're almost to the end. We're right there. If you look at 314 at the top, first impressions, very important, right? Being punctual, important. Remembering to contact the client by their name, also extremely important, right? First impressions are absolutely critical. Now, you're, of course, at the middle of 314 where it says needs and interests. Open-end versus closed-end questions. An open-end question forces the client to talk. Why do you want a three-car garage? Well, my daughter just turned 17. We just bought her a car. We want her to be able to park in the garage with my wife and myself. We need a three-car garage. Well, I know your daughter just turned 17. I know that you, you just got her a car. You know, it forces the client to open up. Closed-end questions could be answered with a yes or could be answered with a no. These are less desirable versus open-end questions at the middle of 300 and 14. The other thing that is important to remember about qualifying is with regard to something called capacity or income. There are two ratios that are extremely important when you look at capacity. There is the front end ratio and there is the back end ratio, front end and back end. This is a ratio of housing to gross income. Back end ratio is housing plus other debt to gross income. So both of these, are these on the gross or the net income? They're both on the gross income, right? So front end ratio is a ratio of housing to gross income. Generally, this is going to be about 28%. New QM rules are going to call the back maximum 43% on the back. So if you're in a position where your buyer goes out and leases a brand new Benz before the escrow closes, is that going to screw up your front end or back end ratio? Back end ratio, right? It's going to screw up the back end ratio. So housing to gross income is on the front. Housing plus other debt is the back end ratio. So you got to tell your client while they're in escrow, don't buy anything. Don't buy lunch without calling me first. I don't have to go that far. But don't buy, make any big purchases. Don't apply for a credit card. Don't get a new TV. Definitely don't go get a car. You can get all that stuff after you close. That's going to screw up your back end ratio. And you'll see both of these terms on page 316. Front end, middle of 316. Back end, 
bottom at 316. Both of these ratios are extremely important. Gross income or net income? Gross, right? Before taxes are taken out. Oh, it's, there's, no, there's no standard. That's why they're standardizing it by calling it 43% under the new QM rules. No, it could be up to 50% in some instances. And some loans will still be, except higher than this, it's just under that qualified mortgage rule, the max on the back is now 43% for purchase in the secondary market by Fannie and Freddie. There was, no, there was not, there was, that's what I'm saying, there was no standard, uh, there was no standard before. What, is, what exactly is included in debt? Anything that would show up on a credit report. So not your cell phone bill, not your gym membership, not your insurance payments, but like credit cards, student loans would show up on that, car payment, you know. Utilities, utilities won't show up on this because they won't show up on your credit report. Now, really quickly on 319 and 320, planning your efforts with the buyer. There's three ways to show property, frankly, as you plan your efforts. One way is you could follow the most logical route. Another way is you could go from the worst property to the best property, or you could go from the best to the worst. What would you recommend? There's no right or wrong, just an interesting thought as you plan your progressive revelation, worst to the best. Sometimes agents will follow, just follow the most logical route, you know, or sometimes it just, it just depends. So something to think about as you plan your efforts. Now, if somebody is moving here from Montana and has never been to the beach and they're moving to Manhattan Beach for the beach lifestyle, what road are you going to take? You're going to take, P but there's more traffic on PCH. Doesn't matter, right? That's what, they're buying the beach lifestyle. Yeah, it's, it's, you can, yeah, you can take some other side street, but we want to show them what the beach lifestyle, of course, on 319 is all about. On 320, remember to listen. Two ears, one mouth. That ratio is important. You're not going to win sales by winning arguments, frankly, on page 320. You might do a property tour presentation on 321 and 322. You can get this from the MLS for free on 321 and 322, or you can get it from toolkit, cma.com. So, this is kind of cool because the buyer can make notes of the stuff that they liked in each house, the stuff that they didn't like in each property, and it's, it's useful for a buyer to have something to write on and, and, and all. Now, really quickly here, if you look at page number 324 and 325, selling the neighborhood. You're selling the location. If you're selling, let's say, Santa Monica, what are some things you're going to pitch the buyer on for a city like Santa Monica? Schools. Schools. What else? Shopping, restaurants, restaurants yeah. the beach, walkability, the pier, right? These are all the things that we're going we're gonna to pitch them on in terms of the area. Do you think that just because the wife speaks more than the husband in the relationship that she makes the decisions? <laughs> Smart man. So the husband might speak more, but the wife really makes the decision. So the wife might speak more, but the husband. Sometimes people buy homes just for their kids, just to move the kid from one school district to another so they can play football. I just sold a house to a guy that we, uh, in a city called La Habra because La Habra apparently has a really good high school football team and they have a good program into D1 schools. So he literally moved from Arcadia to La Habra just so his kid could play varsity football his sophomore or junior year with the La Habra football team, right? I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big commitment. So really the person I was talking to that whole time wasn't the, wasn't the dad. It was like the kid, frankly, the whole time. The kid bought, the dad bought a $500,000 house so the kid could play football at La Habra. So involving the whole family at the bottom of 325. Sell benefits on 326. We're selling benefits, not features. If you look at a pool, what's the benefit to the pool? The benefit would be what? Party. Family party. Yeah, family, pool party, health, fitness, recreation, whatever. The feature is just, you know, it's just a water, right, with chlorine in it. We don't want to sell the feature. We want to sell the benefit. Mrs. Johnson, I know how hard it's been. You know, little Timmy gets kicked out of all those local apartment pools all the time. Why don't we buy a pool or buy this home with the pool? You're going to be able to keep an eye on him. You're not going to have to drive him all around town. That's the benefit. Maybe there's two palm trees in a backyard with a hammock in the middle. And you tell that buyer, can you imagine on a 
warm, winter, or warm summer evening, your favorite glass of wine and a book, just falling asleep in between those two palm trees. That's the benefit as opposed to the feature here at the bottom of page 326 and the top of 327. How about this here at the bottom of 327, using tie downs. This is the neighborhood you wanted, isn't it? This is the neighborhood that you were asking for, right? So it forces a yes response at the middle of 327, right? In using tie downs, it forces a yes. So do we want to use tie downs? Of course. Do we want to use open end or closed end questions? We want to use open end questions at uh, the bottom of 327. Now, two last things, 329 and 330 from this chapter. Maybe the whole 2008, our company bought a bus from UC Santa Barbara, a big broken down transportation bus, probably seated 20 people, bought it for like six grand. We put another $5,000 into it, painted it blue, and on the side, we got these big stickers that said Repo Bus Tour, and then our company logo. Every Saturday morning, from 9 a.m. to about noon, I held 20 people hostage in that bus, and we went to see five to 10 of the cheapest foreclosed homes in the Inland Empire. So I had a driver, I had a big microphone, and we basically drove all around to five to 10 foreclosed properties, and they were all vacant, had the keys, used our lockbox, and just entered. We probably sold at least one house every weekend during those multiple prospect home tours. That, is anybody did anybody take our class in Norwalk? The bus is parked behind that Norwalk office still, like with three flat tires and cobwebs. Out of the area or whatever. Yeah. This was in Ontario, Cucamonga, Fontana, Rialto, Colton, you know, yeah, the, the Stockton of here. So, yeah, that's multiple prospect home tours on 329. And the nice thing is they at least had to wait till it ended because I was their ride. So even if they didn't like the first one, they were stuck, you know, for the next six. Right before lunch, we ended the tour, right? Right before lunch. So if you look at page 330, the very last thing from this chapter, very last thing on 330, is you know most of this stuff, right? Because you weren't raised by wolves. You know this. Should you enter a property with a lit pipe? Obviously not, right? Should you make disparaging remarks about the property while the owners are present? Of course not. One thing that you might not know, though, is this first black square at the top of 330. If you come to a property and you notice that someone else is showing it, what should you do? Wait outside. Yeah, wait outside. Wait inconspicuously until that other person has finished their showing. The only time I would say there's an exception to that is if it's raining. If it's raining, whatever, right? Just enter and quietly walk, quietly walk through. So let's look at the chapter nine quiz on 333. Let's try number one, chapter nine quiz. Let's try number one. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Oliver. Colors for a for sale sign are likely to be in the bulk of the area looking for more expensive homes. Colors from a for sale sign are what? Viewers from the outside. Excellent. They're, excellent. They're satisfied with the exterior appearance. And are they satisfied with the area? Yes. Yeah, best answer is going to be what? Answer choice D. Excellent. Answer choice D. Um, let's look at uh, number five. Try number five here. Anyone, please, number five. Anyone with an English copy of the book, number five. <laughs> <laughs> Right. All the above, excellent. Number five, qualifying someone, all this stuff from a financial perspective as well as from an emotional perspective. How about page number two, uh, 334? Let's try number six and seven. 334, how about number six? Uh, Robin, please, number six. The friend demo qualifying ratio is the ratio of gross housing cost to gross income versus income to net income. Net housing cost to net income, none of the above. Best answer here is what? A, excellent, excellent, A. The gross housing cost to gross income, right? Total house payment, 
against your gross income. How about number seven? Best answer is what? B. B like boy, right? Total housing expenses, that's the front end, plus what? Long-term debt against the gross income. Excellent. How about number 10? Last one, number 10. If another agent is showing a home and you arrive or showing what you do, A, bring your prospects in and let them know you're competing with other buyers for the house. <laughs> B, trust the house I'll be showing with until your third has not been sold. C, wait 10 consecutively until the other agent completes his or her showing and leaves. Excellent, excellent. Wait inconspicuously until the other agent leaves. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just had a question about, uh, I noticed that some offices are different and that they won't show you certain houses unless you are pre-qualified. Right. There's certain agents that actually take that position. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. 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 So, and if they don't want to get pre-approved, I mean, you want to be diplomatic about it, of course, but what does it cost to get pre-approved? Nothing. Nothing. Or bank statement if they're cash. Yeah, exactly. Bank statement if they're cash, or the bank statement one's a, a tricky one because, hey, I'm paying cash. Well, I know you're rich. You know you're rich. But the seller is not going to know until we have a bank statement. So rather than ask you for a bank statement in the heat of the moment when you're writing the offer, Either fax or email that to me now, just so I can have it in the file. So when you do find a property that you want, we have that bank statement ready to go. Well, I think that's the most uncomfortable thing out of the entire job, is how do you, you know what I'm saying, when you're trying to do That's up here that. for you, though. It's, a, it's, it's not. It's not. It's very, 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 very normal. I mean, asking a client for a pre-approval letter, easy. You don't even have to you don't have to physically meet them. Like, it could just be all facts. But I would not... Unless they're out of town, you should be having a high level of service where you meet with them face to face. You know, very important.